Well, welcome. Next week will be our last week together in this kind of format. We'll look to see what we can do after May 6th. But uh, it's been really fun to be with you guys on Zoom, although it's just not the same as having you guys here in the patio. So I'm looking forward to uh, just what we do in the next uh, month or so to see what we can do to get together. We're even not sure what that looks like. Depends on the stay-at-home orders from the governor. But we will see something. Uh, see you guys hopefully soon in person. Let me encourage you with these words. These are from 1 Corinthians 4 verses seven through nine, it says but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. When I was reading this, I was thinking, when was the last time you heard somebody call you a name you didn't like. Now that might have been recently, that might have been a long time ago. I've been called names at different times, but this passage calls us jars of clay. And that's not a derogatory or that's not a put down. It's meant to be just kind of an example of, or a description of human life. In Bible times, they had all kinds of jars made out of clay. I have one here. This one was a jar of clay made uh, from our son when he was in college. He took a pottery class, really enjoyed pottery, made several different kinds of pottery uh, while he was there. This one's a pretty decorative one, use it for a vase or whatever. Uh, but in Bible times, the clay was spun on a potter's wheel. Some of it was dried outside in the, in the uh, sun. Some of it was kiln, dry, kiln dried like we do today. Some of it was... Uh, decorated like this one, maybe glazed over. Some of it was um, some of it was very plain, where they use it for common, ordinary kinds of things. Like you see pots that are used for plantings, uh, the clay pots that we have that are orange that you get out of the store. Some were very ornate. Some were used to store the ornate ones. Often were used to store uh, very important documents, or maybe they were used just as decorations around the house. They all had one thing in common, though. These things break really easily. If you drop it off of a shelf, knock it over, it breaks. And that's kind of describing what our physical life is like. When, when this passage talks about we are jars of clay, it means that we are fragile. We are easily broken. So just like, as this description says, just like uh, these jars of clay, Human beings are like that. We are made in God's image in all kinds of different shapes and sizes with all kinds of different functions and gifts. Some are ordinary. Some of us are ordinary and we're made for everyday plain purposes, but God uses us that way. Some he's created for extraordinary purposes. Some are empty and are just for show. But as believers, this physical body, this jar of clay as it describes us, uh, has a unique purpose. We have God through the Holy Spirit living inside of us. That's what this verse tells us. Our purpose isn't to prove how beautiful we are or how important we are. Our purpose is to show, according to this verse, this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Our purpose is to show the world that God makes a difference in our life. So how do we show people that the power in us, in our life, is from God, and not just the things that we are doing in our own abilities, our own strength. He closes out that passage by saying we are pressed, but not crushed. You may be feeling overwhelmed by homework, by tension at home, all kinds of different things right now. But we also know that God comforts us in those times. We are pressed, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We have no idea when our lives are going to get back to normal with this coronavirus thing. But we know that God is in control. We are perplexed, wondering, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. Some of you have been rejected by friends because you haven't gone to a party or something that they were, want to be involved in. Some of you feel like you've been rejected by parents through a divorce or those kinds of things. But we know that God will never leave us. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. 
We may get sick, we may die we, of a disease or an accident, but we know that we will live eternally because God lives inside of us, inside this jar of clay. We are struck down but not destroyed. Normal jars of clay, easily broken. Believers' jars of clay display the power of God and cannot be broken. Tonight, I want to introduce you to Jake Helling. Some of you know Jake. He graduated last year from high school. Similar to Nicole Britton that we interviewed a couple of weeks ago, Jake spent uh, the last few months with YWAM, uh, both in Hawaii and in a place that he'll tell us more about. So listen to Jake's story. Well, good evening. Tonight we have with us Jake Helling. Jake, a year ago, was sitting in the same seats that you normally sit at in the patio. He was a high school student here uh, from Parker's Prairie. And this last year, he was able to spend some time with YWAM. A couple weeks ago, we interviewed Nicole Britton, who spent some time with YWAM also. So Jake has had some similar experiences, but we're going to hear from him tonight. So Jake, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your spiritual journey. Yeah, so growing up, I moved around a lot, and I ended up living in Parker's Prairie, and I came to church here. And growing up, I just really was very passionate, and I really wanted to have a strong relationship with Christ. But most of my friend groups in school and stuff, they just weren't really into it. They were more into the world and um, pleasing themselves. But I just was really passionate about pursuing Christ. So I just wanted to live how Jesus did. And Jesus came, and he lived for us by, like, serving us. And so I thought, oh, okay, well, the best way for me to live a godly life would be to serve others. So I just tried to look in as many ways as I could to serve others. I would hold the door open for others during class. I would wait to the end of the line during lunch. And I just go out of my way to just do things for other people. But the thing is, I was doing it so I was trying to please God. I was trying to make God proud of me. But he was already proud of me. He died on the cross for me. That gave me some uh, turbulence as I was trying to earn something that had already been given to me, something that God had already died, that Jesus had already died for. I was trying to, I was trying to like earn God's approval when he had already sacrificed himself for me and he had like shown his love, he displayed it for me on the cross. And so it took me a while, but I soon realized like that I don't need to earn anything from God because he's already given it all to me. He's given it to me and us as a gift. It's a gift from him to us. And he's only giving it out of love. There's nothing we can do to earn it. We don't deserve it in any way. And through that, I was just able to receive more of God's love for me. And I was able to pour it out on the others without feeling like, oh, I didn't hold the door enough today. Or, oh, I didn't pray for this person today. Um, after just, like, taking it in and soaking in, like, wow, God sent his son and he died for me. And he died for everyone just because he loves us. Like, I don't need to earn his love. Like, he already showed it for us. And he died for the whole world. That's awesome. And you were able to then, after high school, God kind of laid something on your heart uh, called YWAM. We heard about that a couple of weeks ago. And I'm sure you didn't follow in Nicole's footsteps and went somewhere warm for YWAM, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, after high school, I ended up going to YWAM. And Signing up for it, I'm like, I have no clue where I want to go. I just want to serve. I want to go. I want to do something. And I get there. And just on my and where heart, was that? On my heart, I'm feeling Eastern Europe. Never before in YWAM history has there been a team that's gone to Eastern Europe, except for this year. First year, Ukraine, and they're sending the first Fire and Fragrance YWAM team to Ukraine. I'm like, i got to be on that team. <laughs> I put that down as my number one option, and... Three months later, I'm wearing a jacket. <laughs> and where, did, where was your training, your DTS, though? I had DTS in Kona, Hawaii, which was the main base of YWAM. And I was there for three months in training where we had plenty of incredible speakers come in that just encourage us and teach us. It was absolutely incredible. And then the next three months we were out. Um, my team specifically, we went to Ukraine, and we were just out doing um, outreach and reaching out to... Uh, the community there, working with local churches, and just evangelizing on the street. Okay. So you went to DTS first in Kona. Then from Kona, what, what are some things that you learned or God taught you in Kona while you were there in DTS? God really spoke to my heart about how I don't need to earn his love. That's like where he really pounded it into me. 
It was incredible. Just like I've already spoken on this a little, but just how he, how much he loves us and everything that he's done for us. A lot of the stuff the speakers covered was prayer and just like praying for others and learning how to love others and just pour out the love that Jesus has for us onto others. Because sometimes we can just get so full of it and we're like, oh, that Jesus, we love you. But why am I so focused on like sharing that with other people and blessing other people and just helping strengthen that relationship with yourself in Christ and also introducing others to it. So we learn just how to love people and how to pour it out and just a lot about Jesus' love and how we can testify to that. Okay. So then you were able to go to Ukraine. That was your missions part of YWAM. How long you were you in Ukraine? So, yeah, our team was in Ukraine for three months, but things were kind of cut short at the end because of the virus. But I think all in all, it was an incredible experience. Okay. And so what do a life in the day of a YWAM in Ukraine? Oh, man. All right. On outreach. So we'd get up pretty early in the morning. We'd have a meeting in our in our apartment at about 8.30 every morning. Um, we'd meet and we'd kind of go over everything we're going to do that day. And then we'd have maybe like an hour of just worship and just intercession in our, in our house. Um, but most days we would do street evangelism. So after that, we'd maybe have breakfast if there was time. But otherwise, we'd all pile in our team's van and we'd go to a local subway system or... Uh, church or sometimes a train station and sometimes just the city square and we just do live worship we just have signs up like oh we speak English come talk to us and then we'd ask oh can we pray for you or what what's going on in your mind right now because in Ukraine specifically a lot of the people it's it's kind of a colder culture like people aren't so um, outgoing there so they just see these people that are out worshiping in the street like what's going on and then we come and we ask them if we can pray for them, if we can bless them, and we just, like, love on them. And it's it's truly incredible just to be able to love on people who, like, culturally, it's it's so different. Um, and that's something we would do. After that, we would we would go back to um, one of the churches we were partnered with, and we'd, like, discuss and pray over the people that we met. Uh, we'd talk about the testimonies we heard, the testimonies we shared, and we'd... Um, then after that, we'd have intercession, kind of, and then we'd have a team meal. Um, we'd go back home, more intercession, more worship, kind of a prayer time, and then some alone time just in our Bibles, and go to bed, get ready to do the same thing the next morning. Okay. So, in Ukraine, you said the people were colder, they're not as outgoing as they are here. What are some other unique things that you've found in Ukraine that either surprised you or, as a team, you had to work through? <laughs> Well, I think one of the biggest things, and it's probably not um, spiritual at all, is uh, the bathrooms there <laughs> were quite atrocious. Um, there weren't a whole lot of free ones, and the ones on the street you'd have to pay for, and they, they weren't anything special. But spiritually, um, they asked us a lot, like what kind of denomination were we focused on? And we, we weren't focusing on any denomination. But they'd be like, are you Mormon? Are you Orthodox? Catholic? And we're just like, oh, we're just here to share the love of Jesus. We're just here to pray for you. We're just here to bless you, and um, so that was that was interesting. They were kind of, they were, they thought we were like Jehovah Witnesses or something a lot of the time, because what kind of Christians are going outside and worshiping in the middle and just like rejoicing and full of love and everything? It just seemed so weird to them. Uh, but we were just there to like, we were doing it for them. Like it wasn't for us. We weren't putting on a show. We weren't like trying to get attention. Um, so that was something that we had to kind of bridge a gap with. And it would draw their attention, but then we'd have to, we would, like, you know, we'd start loving on them. And we'd be like, we're doing this for you. We're here for you. <laughs> okay. So what's, what would be a predominant church? That you, they were trying to figure out what denomination. So what would be, what they would be most familiar with in Ukraine as far as churches? Yeah. Uh, predominantly there is Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox. Um, personally, I don't know a whole lot about, like, the ins and outs of it. But they assumed us as, like, English speakers were probably Catholic, and sometimes they even thought we were Mormon or something. Um, but we would just tell them, like, oh, we're just here to spread the love of Jesus. We're just here for you. Okay. So what, when you say outreach, you did worship, did you do plays? What, how did you share Christ verbally or non-verbally with, I, I know you loved on him, but what does that mean um, in, a, in what you did during the day? 
Yeah, so in the ways that we would like just show the love of Jesus and our love for them, we would offer to pray for them. We would offer um, spiritual readings, is what we would say, because some people that perhaps weren't religious, they wouldn't want to be like, oh, I don't want to be prayed for by this person for their God. So we would offer like spiritual readings, spiritual prayers. We'd offer, um, we just talk to them, just get to know them. A lot of the people that, since it's like such a cold, shut off kind of culture, um, they don't have people to talk to. So we would just like offer to listen, offer support, pray for them, pray for what they're going through. Another big part of it was children's ministry. And for them, we tried to keep things a little bit lighter. Um, we would start with a little skit, kind of just a fun, uh, non-religious skit, but just to kind of crack them up, get their attention. And then we'd like share Bible stories, like David and Goliath, or Moses and the plagues. Because personally for me, when I was a kid, that, that stuff blew me away. That stuff was incredible. Just like, oh, this small boy defeating a giant. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible, that kind of thing. And we would just share like the bond that God had with his people and that they can have that same kind of bond and that same kind of love can be theirs too. How did you see God work during that time? Anything come to your mind that was specific? Yeah, um, absolutely. We saw plenty of healings. We saw people who couldn't read, could read the Bible, reading a passage in church. We saw um, blind eyes opened. We saw healings, plenty of healings. And we just saw tons of people who were just so shut off and like seemed so cold or like just had been thrown under the bus by their friends, family, and just life. It just seemed so rough for them, like just filled with joy and just overcome by the spirit. And just we were able to love on them and they just rejoiced with us and just incredible. Plenty of things the Holy Spirit would just fill people and it was incredible. Okay. And obviously you met some believers there too, uh, churches. How how are believers in Ukraine different than us, or are they all the same? Do you feel like you're welcome right in? Tell us about that. Um, a lot of them were excited to have us because we're missionaries from the United States. But they, there was one specific church that we went to in Donbass while we were there, and the people there were absolutely incredible. Their church, Donbass, was like a war-torn kind of region between the Russian and Ukrainian conflict that's going on. And they were running a church in the middle of all that. And they would hold services. They'd have people come in. And they were just so on fire for the Lord. Like with everything around them going on, like they were just so passionate. And we would have nights there where we'd go out and just door to door, handing out gifts and inviting people to church. And just seeing the impact that that had on the community was incredible. And that the fire that they had in their heart to like bless people, even though it was like dangerous outside. and. Like, everything around them seemed so gloomy. And just um, just the way that they went through it and just pursued God and the way that he was faithful to them. Just incredible. Okay. And our students may not know a lot about Ukraine conflict with Russia, but I think that's been going on for a while. Mm -hmm. Did you guys experience some of the, the conflict or see the results of that? Um, we did hear a little bit about it, <laughs> literally, too. But... Um, I don't remember the exact name of the town we were in. Donbass is kind of the region. Um, but we were in a small town that was about a mile away from the front line of the conflict at the time, actually. And some nights we'd hear, like, artillery and gunshots just off in the distance. Um, we were so close. But even, like, even through that, just seeing, like, how God still is there and is still present is just absolutely incredible. And how we were able to bless these people was astounding. It turned out um, after we left, I think a few weeks after we left, that town was actually invaded, and we just prayed for those people, and uh, still do today. I just really hope that God's been watching over them, and I'm sure he is. So you're, you said earlier that your trip got cut short because of the virus. Mm -hmm. how, how much shorter was it cut, or what happened? How did you, how did you hear about the virus? Is it, was it big in Ukraine? What was going on with that? Well, the first time we heard about the virus was about halfway through. I think we just kind of heard that there was a virus going on in China. And we're like, oh, okay, well, as long as they contain it, we should be all right. And we got through the majority of our outreach, actually. And um, we were kind of on what we called our debrief. So it was our last few, last few weeks together. So we were just 
we were out um, kind of celebrating the end of our, our outreach, and we were on our way back from that. We were in Odessa for our debrief. We were kind of down by the Black Sea because we wanted to see it. And on our train ride back, our leader gets a text message that um, YWAM is going into code red with everything. And mm. Everyone has to be home within 24 hours. I think it was when Trump was going to issue the travel ban. Sure. So we're all like, oh, man, we have to get back in the U.S. before Friday midnight, you know. And we're on a train at the moment four hours before we even get back to Kiev where our house and apartment is. So, yeah, we, we got back. We threw everything into bags, and next morning, 6 a.m., we were, we were out of there. We had about a week left of ministry we were going to do in Kiev, but it was, it was pretty chaotic for sure. Our, our contacts there were pretty, <laughs> pretty blown away, like, oh, okay, yeah, you got to go. We got to get you out of there. And they were ready to host the next YWAM team too. So I think both of them are, it's good for them. They get to take some time off, but it was pretty crazy. In Ukraine though, um, I don't think, even now I don't think that the coronavirus is such a huge deal. I, at least from what I'd heard, it wasn't spreading so much there. It wasn't, it wasn't like a, it wasn't just um, there. It wasn't very present. <laughs> okay. And you were telling me earlier that you you had a specific job with YWAM. What was your job oh, and how yeah. did you do it? So during lecture phase, I was in the media track where we learned about um, videography and cinematography and just kind of photography and all that. And so then on outreach, I was like the media guy. I had the camera, the GoPro. So I was following a lot of the action. And I just got to get some of the pictures and videos. And it was awesome being able to just record everything that was going on. We would also record um, salvations, prayers, seeds planted, and other things, me and my partner. And it was really good. And I took plenty of pictures. And unfortunately, <laughs> different story. Unfortunately, halfway through it, um, my laptop was actually stolen when our house was broken into. So I lost quite a few of the pictures and my editing software, but it was still, I have, I have plenty left over on my phone. And yeah, it was just incredible to be able to record all of that. So being in front of the camera here, this is just normal for you. <laughs> uh, I don't know about normal. Normally I'm on the other side. <laughs> so I understand what you're going to have to go through with all the editing. <laughs> um, so each, each night that we've done a youth group live, we've asked um, whoever we're interviewing just to give a challenge to our students. What would you challenge our students with tonight? I would just challenge you to step out of your comfort zone for somebody else, to just go out of your way. It can be something big or small, just to kind of show your love for them and show Jesus' love for them. All right. Hey, can I pray for you? Yeah, of course. I pray. Lord, thank you for Jake. Thank you for how you have been instrumental in his life for many years, but how you have shown him that you are a graceful God, that you have completed everything on the cross. He doesn't have to earn his salvation. Thank you for his willingness to share that with other people. Thank you for the experience you've given him, but also the, the ministry opportunities you've given him, both in the United States, but also in Ukraine. We pray for those churches there that that he talked about that are going through just a desperate time right now with the war going on. So, God, we pray a blessing on them. We pray for safety for them. And, God, we just pray as, as you continue to use Jake and, and teach him things that you would just bring him to just a place where he knows that you are uh, in control of his future and that uh, you have his best interests in mind. So thank you for him. Thank you for what you've done in his life. And thank you for the way he served. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank, yeah, thanks for joining us. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next week. All right. Hey, let me wrap up tonight. I want to combine uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, 9, 7 through 9 with Jake's challenge to us tonight. How can you show people around you that it's about God and not about you? That your life, your jar of clay is showing the all-surpassing power of God. And Jake suggested that we find somebody to serve this week. Serve them in a way that God has asked us to serve them. Or find somebody to show God's love to. Pretty simple things to say, hard things to do. So I want to challenge you too to look around. Who can you serve? Who can you show God's love to today? 
I also want to share another verse with you, just a short part of a verse. Philippians 1, 27, first part says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let's do that this week. I'm going to close this out in prayer, but I want to put my phone number up again. 320-808-4357. Call me. If you want to talk, if you want, if you need anything, I'd love to hear from you and talk through some different things that you want to talk about. I'm going to pray us out. Uh, one of the things that I want to mention too, you may have heard this, may not have. We're going to pray, pray for Pastor Greg. Many of you know Pastor Greg. Uh, his wife, Jan, passed away today unexpectedly. So it's, it's new, it's raw, it's, it's fresh. So I just want to pray for him uh, and his family and things they'll be going through in the next days and weeks to come. So let's pray. Lord, thanks tonight for the challenge from Jake. Thanks for what you've been doing in his life leading up to YWAM, during YWAM, and since then. Thank you for his challenge to us tonight. Let us show that this body that you indwell uh, has your power coming through it and not just our own strength. God, I want to pray for Pastor Greg this, this evening, just the comfort that he needs, the people that he needs around him, the strength he needs from you to know that you are in control. God, I just pray that you would give him that, that you would help us, people that know and love him, to rally around him and show him that love and comfort that comes for you. Thanks for this group. Thanks for how you love each one of us. Thank you that that one day we are going to be able to be back together. So thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.